Uh, my name is Barry Colt from the Director of Research here. It's really great to have our speakers, Attain, and you with us in person here in Norcott, Georgia Street, and those online. Uh, delighted to welcome you to Fractured Union, Politics, Sovereignty, and the Fight to Save the UK with Professor Mike Kenny from the University of Cambridge, who's going to be speaking to his excellent recent book, and I think beyond its pages a little, little bit as well. I just want to do two quick things. First, is to acknowledge uh, Paul Gillespie and Sarah Wallace from the Constitutional Futures After Brexit Project at the School of Politics and International Studies at University College Dublin. I think I got all the, the right words in the right order there. My alma as well. My two almas, in fact, UCD and Cambridge. So just really uh, appreciative of, of your presence here, Paul and Sarah, and just to um, thank you for facilitating Mike's trip to Dublin. So Mike is here with us by your good graces. So thank you so much. And also just to thank Atain Tanham from TCD and also Trinity College Dublin um, and an active member of the Institute's community here for chairing. So thanks a million, Atain. And further ado, I'll hand over to you. Um, thanks, Barry, very much for the presentation. Um, and Paul and Sarah as well. And most of all, really, Michael, thank you for coming over um, on mic. Um, it's a privilege to interview and talk about this and chair this session. Um, as Barry said, um, the book is absolutely excellent, A Less Fractured Union, Where Next for the UK's Territorial Constitution after the general election 2024. Um, so it is superb. It fills a huge gap in research, in looking for me as someone who specialises in Northern Ireland and Brexit and British-Irish relations. It gives a much needed broader perspective on the union and on devolution and how it affects the islands as well, I think. Um, so just some housekeeping. Um, this is uh, not Chatham House rules, so we're being recorded, um, is the first thing to note. There will be questions and answers after Mike speaks, after around 25 minutes or so. Um, and if you would put up your hand at that time for those in here in um, Not Virtually and introduce yourself and keep the questions uh, concise, I suppose, rather than commentaries. And also people on social media, very welcome as well to send questions in. Um, I'll be monitoring <clears throat> that as well. Um, a reminder then again that <clears throat> it is on the record. Um, so just uh, as to doubly alert you to that. And please do engage with social media, Twitter, um, about any comments, commentaries here or comments that you have uh, yourself. So just to introduce Professor Kenny, um, Michael Kenny is Professor of Public Policy and the inaugural director of the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at the University of Cambridge, where he leads the Institute's Place and Public Policy Programme. He's also visiting fellow at the UCL Constitution Unit, a fellow of the UK's Academy of Social Sciences, and holds advisory positions with the Constitution Society, the Behaviour Change by Design Project, and the Science of Global Risk Project. His research includes leading projects on left behind communities, social infrastructure and devolution, and the future of the UK constitution. His latest book is entitled Fractured Union, Politics, Sovereignty and the Fight to Save the UK. So thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Aten. And um, just to uh, echo your thanks to um, to Barry here at the IIEA and also to um, to Paul and Sarah um, and the excellent project that, that they are doing. I had a, a taste of it in the workshop that's happening around this event and uh, it's really important and interesting research. So um, what I'm going to do is talk to uh, this book uh, which has uh, come out uh, recently and what I'm going to try to do is give you a sense of the main lines of argument. There's always a a danger in doing that that I'll I'll skate too over too much um, uh, ice uh, too quickly, but it's I prefer to do that, and then you can in questions, um, you know, we can dig into some of the issues and, and episodes I'm talking about, um, and then if I get my timing right, I will land I hope at the end uh, at the UK election, which as you know is taking an interesting turn. Um, so one of the things I think that's distinctive about my um, account of the devolved union, uh, you'll be aware there's a, there's a lot of writing on it, a lot of discourse on it, a lot of politics around the UK union, particularly after Brexit. One of the things I emphasize is England and um, the significance or the, or the almost overlooked 
importance and role of the English and attitudes, shifting attitudes amongst the English. Now that may say sound strange because very obviously 85% of the population of the UK, the English public is clearly very significant in numerical terms. And yet in many treatments of devolution and the union, both in the academic world, but also I think in many ways, in the ways in which policymakers at the center of British government think and act in relation to the union, it is as if the English are bystanders. They are almost sort of outside the main story of devolution being developed elsewhere. I think that's been a big mistake. And it has, that assumption has blinded us, I think, in many ways, to the role that shifts in English national sentiment may have played in shaping the judgments of the two main British parties, Labour and the Conservatives, who are, after all, competing mostly for, for votes in the English market, as it were, particularly the Conservatives. The Conservative Party has, until the last couple of weeks, been for a long time the dominant party of English opinion. And of course, so it, it's developed policy in this area in relation to, in through making judgments about, often tacit judgments, things that are not always articulated, about the moods of different sections of English opinion. That I think you can see in particular quite dramatically after the Scottish referendum of 2014. And you may remember in the very speech in which David Cameron announced the result, responded to it, he very controversially included reference to the English question, the need to answer the, uh, or to, to give airing to English voices and an awful lot followed from that. Then more latterly in the context of Brexit, we've had very big, significant policy decisions being made in part in reference to judgments about English opinion. So England matters in all of this. This was an, uh, a previous book that I wrote on that specific question. The new book takes as central these three very big questions. Uh, how have these the political and constitutional crises or tests, stress tests, as I call them, of the period since 2014 affected the way in which Whitehall and Westminster, the British Centre, has approached and sought to manage the devolved union. So the three crises being the Scottish referendum, Brexit, and then COVID, which is a different kind of exogenous challenge. Then secondly, is breakup more or less likely after this near decade of turbulence? And then thirdly, and I'll pick this question up directly towards the end, has the UK re union reached a, a kind of inflection point in the way in which it's organized and managed and a sub question there is what might that mean for Northern Ireland? So what I'm gonna do here is, uh, this is the bit where I'm gonna move fast over probably too much uh, uh, stuff, but I'll give it a go. I'm just gonna give you a flavor of, these are set out these crises in three different chapters in the book. But here, I'm just gonna pull out what I think are some of the most interesting and important lessons that we can derive for them in terms of this question about how has the British state been managing this complex, multi-stranded, asymmetrical union? So to start with the Scottish referendum 2014, what does this extended four episode, which you may recall, ended in victory for the, uh, for the union side, but actually was, as I document in the book, extremely painful and the source of considerable angst and division internally? What do we learn from that? Um, one thing I'll say by, by way of starting, um, it's, it's been a really interesting sh shift at sort of um, amongst those who were involved with that campaign. I mean, it was an extraordinary campaign that was sort of led from within a tight group at the top of the British state, but reaching down into Scotland. Um, the George Osborne, who was then Chancellor, who was actually the lead political figure over over seeing that campaign now refers to it as a sort of great success and a triumph which is understandable because he's comparing it with the next one that they the next referendum was brexit that they didn't where they were not successful um that is a judgment that reflects changed circumstances at the time as i say in the book nobody on the union side would have thought that a result which re, re, result which involved 
45% of Scots voting for independence. Nobody would have thought that was a good outcome. In fact, I report a conversation of a couple of ad advisors joking about this, saying, well, if 45% vote for yes, we're out of our jobs. They weren't, and that's an interesting point. But this shows you, I think, how perspectives and expectations have shifted in this in the subsequent years. The key, one of the key moments here was the discovery at the top. This was a coalition government. If you remember, it was a Conservative and Lib Dem coalition that, that were suddenly required to fight this referendum because of a decision Cameron made. Finding that the local Labour political machine, which in Scotland was supposed to do the heavy lifting, this was supposed to deliver the uh, Labour voters who were wavering uh, and clearly interested in independence, it was supposed to deliver them en masse. And it was not there. It had simply imploded. Uh, and the very discovery that, I mean, it tells you something about central uh, some relations between central politics and Scotland, that this was actually a shock to most of the, including Labour figures, to discover the degree of, of corrosion. They therefore invented a new vehicle, Better Together, um, which has had lots of different sort of histories written of it. What I was interested in were, were vertical relations between the centre and that and that campaign, and they were fraught, to put it mildly, a real problem about connecting between these different layers, levels of territorial politics. There's been a lot of discourse on, you know, did 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 was this really uh, a victory for the union because of Project Fear? because basically the central emphasis of the campaign, if you remember, was on the economic risk on the, on the, and the security risks, but predominantly economic on the risks that Scotland would take if it went independent. And that was a big element of it. But what that misses is a very interesting and complex set of internal debates in government about what kind of campaign to fight, what the balance should be between that more sort of negative project fear emphasis and on more positive arguments for the union. And then there was a separate uh, sort of element of tension because there were some conservative figures in the cabinet, but backbenchers too, who wanted a campaign around British patriotism, who wanted basically the union to be saved by appealing to the Britishness that was is still clearly imminent and quite powerful in parts of Scotland. There was never a clear resolution of those different arguments and tendencies. Just as an aside, it links to something we were talking about in the previous session. Uh, there was a really interesting program of a project to produce a series of uh, in-depth uh, pieces of analysis that were overseen by the Treasury of all different aspects of the independence proposition most of which were about economic risk, but lots of other things about identity, about which were, and they crafted a sort of an account of Scotland in the Union. It's one of the very few attempts actually to do that in an extended way, but of course, only directed at Scotland. And it's a kind of interesting moment that this was supposed to be, as one interviewee put it to me, the ammunition that they would give to the local campaign to, to use uh, in, in its sort of ground war. That never happened. That sort of connection never quite transpired. I think the other thing we, that we can um, learn from this or think about in relation to this is there's something here about the, the discovery at the heart of British government and politics that unionism is a multi-stranded tradition which has different idioms in different parts of the UK. I mean, obviously... In Northern Ireland, that's very clear. But this was a kind of painful realisation that actually, if you like, the political language that central government might talk in terms of the union is a long way from how Scottish unionists or most Scottish unionists were thinking and feeling about this campaign. Brexit quickly, it's a lot obviously to say about that, but I think the sort of macro lessons here are that Brexit destroys the sort of creative ambition ambiguity about where sovereignty lies in the British model, which has been, was a feature, I think, of the early years of devolution. So, you know, there are different, at least two very different understandings in constitutional terms of the status of the devolved institutions in Belfast, in probably less so in Belfast, but in, in certainly in Edinburgh and in Cardiff. 
And those different interpretations had sort of lived alongside each other. They could be fudged, they could be managed when Labour's in power across Britain. After Brexit, you can't, there's nowhere to hide. There are just these different views and they play out in politics. They play out in the courts, of course, as well. And I think that's been a very important sort of longer lasting legacy of Brexit. Northern Ireland in particular, um, I think, what do we learn about British political attitudes to Northern Ireland? I mean, for the most part, to, to summarise a complex story, Northern Ireland is very much weaponized in the context of the ongoing divisions over Brexit. Um, and the alliance that forms against in the Conservative Party against May's backstop solution is led by figures who articulate sovereignty claims about Northern Ireland that are clearly in some tension with the Good Friday Agreement. Um, and that has opened up a new sort of political, I won't say divide, but a new there's a new sort of element of political um, energy that has gone into the politicization of um, those issues around Northern Ireland that had previously been seen as entirely consensual in British, high British politics. And to put it bluntly, I think after Brexit, despite, in a weird way, despite the centrality of Northern Ireland to so many aspects of the debates about the withdrawal agreement and, and the negotiations with the EU, I think in many ways, Northern Ireland is even more a place of part for British politicians and government and not least because of the, the uh, obviously the arrangements put in place by the protocol and the Windsor framework, but also I think just the sense amongst British politics, politicians, that this is an issue they really want to avoid getting entangled with once more. Then finally COVID, um, which is a very different kind of challenge. I mean, here was obviously, you know, the question, the, the, the question raised for the devolved union here is can these different governments that have been formed can they come together in the face of an obvious shared enemy, an external common foe? And the answer is, uh, for the most part, not. But it's more complicated than that. I mean, some of you may have followed the inquiry, the UK government inquiry, which has been going rolling on about um, decision making uh, in the context of COVID and has also landed in Edinburgh and in Cardiff. Most of that, I think, has been incredibly unilluminating, has been about WhatsApps and lack of trust between different figures and dysfunctional decision making. But behind that, there's a story that I try to tell, which is more complicated and interesting. And that partly what happens is that um, there is one of the things that, 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 that you do begin to see if you look closely at the decision making is a sort of gap between the tenor and nature of relationships in the political realm, when you do begin to see the devolved leaders signaling their independence from Johnson, they don't want to be seen as taking the lead from Johnson in terms of the um, behavioural rules that they are bringing in. But also you see Johnson actually in his administration deliberately pulling away from the early weeks of cooperation. There was this very interesting period for about six weeks when everything was choreographed and relations, it was probably the high point under uh, under the Conservative administration since Brexit of relations with the devolves. And it falls down like a souffle. It's astonishing how quickly that falls apart. Two things I just say in, uh, before leaving COVID here. One is that um, the initial, I was, I was, not many things here have shocked me, but I was a bit shocked to discover, maybe shows me, shows you how naive I am. That, that actually one of the initial responses in British government was to seriously consider a legal challenge to the uh, prospects of the devolved administrations handling the behavioural rules, the public health side of this. That, I think, tells you a lot. I mean, it was within the Department of Health, which doesn't have a sort of track record of dealing with devolution because health is devolved elsewhere. But that shows you, A, a sort of complete lack of and the grasp really of devolution and be a kind of abiding sense in the center that look here this is a crisis it's time for us it's time for central government to take control and i mean you even saw that in there were shades of that in the inquiry when people like johnson matt, matt hancock one or two other former ministers said in a very matter of fact way that they thought it would have been better had the uk managed the whole crisis now given this is cognitive dissonance of high order, because given what we were also learning in those inquiries about how 
dysfunctional decision making was. Now, to be fair, it was dysfunctional pretty much everywhere, but there's something very revealing there, I think, about the sort of lack of engagement with acceptance of this new model. The other thing I would say, I go into this in some nerdy detail in the in the in the chapter here. If you look at, depending on how you measure it, but if you look at most of the health outcomes in terms of COVID and compare across the four administrations, from what I my reading of other experts who know a lot more than me about this of their reading of it is it made very little difference. Overall, it really did not make a huge difference whether you lived in Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland or England. It did at certain points, actually. And we all remember there were certain moments where the, the data did diverge. But actually, as um, certainly with hindsight, the more analysis of this retrospectively, it looks as if it didn't make a huge difference, which I think is very interesting to reflect on, actually, from both a kind of pro-devolution and maybe pro-central government perspective. So what else has been happening? Just a couple more slides, then I'll, I'll move to finishing. Um, I think one of the things that has happened here that I want to emphasize is that something very unspectacular and uh, but potentially quite important has, I think, been has come together in a rather incremental and adaptive way throughout this period. And it's almost hidden by the obsession with political conflict and crisis. It is the emergence of shared forms of governance that obviously asymmetrical forms um, with varying degrees of success. Some have been institutionalized very publicly. Some are very informal and typically most relations between governments are of course informal in this system lots of bilateral dealings and arrangements. The formal bit was a project that ran for five years at the height of the Brexit crisis, involving all four governments who finally, after five years, agreed a new system for bringing the different governments together, this intergovernmental relations machinery. I think it's fascinating that all of them eventually signed up to this model, and each government actually conceded in that negotiation. It's a very interesting um, instance, which does suggest they all saw the ultimate administrative value, the need, I would argue the imperative under the heading of good governance, to have a more systemic, structured way of dealing with each other. Um, I think it reflects the recognition at the administrative level of the realities of growing cross-border engagement, I mean, obviously, Brexit itself is partly the reason for that and the return of powers and these areas of regulation. And also, it follows the additional devolution to Scotland and Wales after 2015 in the areas of tax, social security. And I think what's interesting is that this process has been going along in a parallel vein at the same time as the, the political principles have been falling out and having these sometimes staged very public conflicts. You remember recently conflicts between the Scottish government and the UK government over gender ID, the Scottish government's gender ID um, legislation, also over the less less interesting sounding deposit return scheme. But it is a very interesting uh, uh, test case, actually, of uh, some of the some of the powers of the different governments. And what's interesting is those spats happened because the political principles chose not to use this new machinery that their governments had signed up to. It, so it does tell you about its limitations. It's easy to evade. But at the same time, it also reminds us that, you know, politics, the political incentives, particularly of the period we've lived through with the Scottish National Party in government, an English Conservative Party that has become very centralising or muscular, as some people put it, in its approach to the union, that created the conditions for open political conflict. But as I say, other things were going on beneath that level and lots of interesting semi-formal networks amongst officials who have been disposed to cooperation and productive engagement. Whether this sort of creeping administrative interaction, more stable forms of interaction, whether this provides the basis for a a kind of administrative form of statecraft moving into the next era is, I think, actually quite an important question. It might be something on which a future Labour government, if there is one, wants to build. Then British unionism, which I know is, is the sort of subject of, of the day in terms of the workshop here and, and the Northern Irish um, dimension of that in particular. So 
one thing we didn't need the, the recent crisis to teach us, but it has reminded us of, is that there are very different understandings of the union. There are different forms of unionism that have long been encompassed within the UK's evolving constitutional model. What is striking about the current period in terms of central government and Westminster is, I think, the loss of confidence among many British politicians in the current arrangements. And that is manifested in growing support for two sort of reformist projects. One, which has been partially implemented by the Johnson government and its successors, was a view that authority needed to be recentralized that particularly in the autonomy of the British executive needed to be restored, that devolution needed to be curbed or curtailed to some extent. And that, that on the uh, in policy terms, actually, there has been some sort of follow through of that, not as much as you might think. And that's partly because there's an older pragmatic Tory understanding of these issues that also fed into those governments and was actually very much uh, represented in many of these stats by Michael Gove. That's one project. The other one is maybe now becomes kind of particularly politically interesting is a more kind of quasi federal idea, an old idea. Should the UK be remade in a federal uh, on federal lines, particularly associated with Gordon Brown and a number of uh, politicians, thinkers on the centre left. The thing about these projects, I would argue, is that they are as much manifestation as cause, I think, of of the kind of wider constitutional, uh, the territorial politics of the centre. Neither of them are that deeply established in their parties. I mean, what we have seen, you only have to look at Labour's manifesto. What they are trying to do is walk away from some of the commitments in Brown's constitutional commission. They're not radically endorsing them. Uh, the Conservative Party, I think, is very ambivalent about this sort of centralising unionism. It is possible that a heavily defeated Conservative Party may go much more wholeheartedly in that direction and, and the brakes will be off. That, that is, I think, a prospect that now becomes uh, something to ponder. But I think more generally, it's easy to overstate or to underestimate, should I start, easy to underestimate the degree to which there has also been continuity in the thinking and approach at the centre. And I certainly, I, you know, at the time I did lots of interviews and asked lots of people, politicians, civil servants, are we at an inflection point? I didn't put it like that. I argued in, you know, asking questions, you have to get the question wording right. But I more or less asked that. And I nearly everyone said yes. At the height of breaks, everyone felt that. Actually, as we move out of that crisis period or the heat of that crisis, it's less obvious. And there are some continuities. There has been some evolution. And I do think if we look at Labour's manifesto in one final slide, so this obviously is where we are now, Rishi in the rain. If you look at Labour's, I mean, I focused here on Scotland, but, but some of this applies to the union more widely. This is really... I, I, it's, it, it's quite hard to characterise it simply, but I think Labour, it feels and looks as if it will be quite a centralist project, quite centrally focused. Their missions, I think, require a kind of reorganisation of the centre and are very much going to be driven by central government. And there's a new tone on the devolution. We'll hear a lot more about partnership. They want to have more productive relations. But it's not really clear at all about whether they will make different kinds of decisions and whether they have fully embraced some of the implications and the sort of logic of devolved governments that may, for instance, wish to pursue different kinds of policies to those favoured by central government. My final, final point is that I think, I go back to where I started, I think England now matters in for set, for set politicians at the centre in a way it did not before. The focus on English devolution, which is very developed in the Labour manifesto, is no accident. I think that one of the biggest concerns that's sort of dawning now on British politicians is that if they lose the goodwill and the, the, the tacit consent of the English for this very strange composite model of government that we've got, then the union really is in trouble. Thank you very much.